Hello, everyone. This is Chris Mitchell. The uh, one, one of the things I wanted to say is that if you don't want to identify yourself or where you're from, you can feel free to remain somewhat anonymous. Um, you know, some people may want to talk about a community and they don't want to necessarily share uh, where they are, and we'll respect that. But in general, to the extent people are willing to share that, I think it may lead to a stronger discussion. Um, this is the first time we're doing this, so uh, we're going to muddle along a little bit, but the goal is fundamentally to answer questions that you have, and uh, with the, the idea being that questions that you have are likely to uh, be ones that other people have as well. So um, are there any questions to start? All right, so we have a couple of questions to start. Um, Mel is asking uh, about an orientation here and locating a mentor or a guide. Um, the, um, I think it's a good question. Um, it's hard to find a specific mentor or guide, I think. Um, this is um, an issue where it will depend very much on where you are. So one thing you'll want to do is identify other communities that have a similar uh, makeup, whether it's demographically, doesn't have to be necessarily be the same size, but maybe in similar region um, where they've gone through something like this uh, and talking with them. There's there's also people like John St. Julian, who is a, the organizer um, who worked really hard and diligently in Lafayette, Louisiana uh, for many years or to organize around this. And he's often willing to, to give advice. Um, and I can connect you to people like that. Um, I think to some extent, depending on where you are, um, we're going to be having to mentor each other. I want to call out my colleague, Lisa. Lisa, are you on, and do you have any thoughts on this? I am on, and can everybody hear what I'm saying? I just yes. unmuted myself. <laughs> okay. Um, um, in terms of finding a mentor or a guide, um, and I, I'd like to address that, but also I want to jump ahead and sort of um, also address the next question um, regarding political support, because I think the two might be uh, related to each other. Um, I would suggest... Um, reaching out to um, people in city government staff and, and asking them about um, people that they know of who maybe have um, contacted them, either people who actually work on this issue or maybe who um, they know of who have, a, 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 who have contacted them about this issue before. Um, Chris, I know that um, we don't always have luck with this, but sometimes um, people can find each other this way. And um, city council meetings, going to city council meetings, sometimes you can find people that way that have the same um, the same interests as you. Um, how do you feel about that, Chris? Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think it's it's a it's a good idea, which is trying to find other local support and and helping each other along. I think. To some extent, it, it will be helpful if you identify people that have worked on other issues of local organizing in the past. And a lot of times, the communities that are successful in this uh, are areas in which you know someone's involved that has an experience uh, organizing uh, people locally, which generally means you know doing things like figuring out how to share information, establishing a network, and and, and sending information. Um, out to people who are likely to be interested. It means trying to grow that group of people by uh, maybe having meetings, you know, putting postings in community spaces where people will see it, or uh, in some cases banding together to run, and this is a little bit true 10 years ago more so than now, but running an ad in a, in a newspaper, for instance. Um, it means really figuring out who the people in the community that you need to persuade are. And that may mean having some people that represent communities of faith, uh, having local business leaders and things like that so that you can um, you know, make sure that you're showing support for a larger group of people than if I was to you know, maybe just um, – talk about what we're seeing here in St. Paul, Minnesota, you know, the people who are most interested in a community fiber network tend to be people who are really focused on the internet. You know, it's a lot of us sort of geeks who are interested in policy and things like that. And if we're ever really going to be effective, we need to figure out how to reach a wider cross-section of the community. Um, um, may I jump in? 
Uh, this yes. is my question. I would second that, and I would also suggest that um, there are people who probably are within your own sphere. I mean, I know that there are a lot of parents um, at my kids' school who have the same concerns as I do relating to these issues. And a lot of times, your web of support can start close to home and branch out in ways like that. All right, yeah, and Mike, you were going to say something? Oh, no, this was Cola here. Okay. Yeah, um, I guess mainly my question uh, is more about gaining conservative support. Um, I'm in Buffalo, and I think we're developing a network of support uh, in the more progressive liberal community, but I think gaining the support of re Republicans and conservatives is going to be more difficult. Um, I know the strategy of appealing towards economic development. Uh, it's been so, so successful for Chattanooga. Uh, serving more rural areas that still have dial-up. Um, I know those are, those are two approaches. Um, I just reached out to the Buffalo Chamber of Commerce trying to get their support. Um, so I'm kind of wondering what you guys think in that regard. I think that's a very good question. And the challenge of getting conservative support in a place like Buffalo is considerably different than a place like rural Colorado, which we saw yesterday where conservatives have overwhelmingly supported this. Um, I think this is a question that is somewhat new to us in that most of the cities that have done this aren't nearly the size of Buffalo. And things that I would recommend would be certainly go to the Chamber of Commerce, but expect that they are probably not going to be very supportive. Um, I would expect that uh, Time Warner Cable is probably a strong member of the Chamber of Commerce and gives a lot of money to it. Uh, so you may want to see about if there's more local chambers. So sometimes there will be um, a chamber of uh, in a neighborhood um, or uh, other kinds of groups of business leaders that you can talk to. And I think you want to be able to explain to them why the private sector is unlikely to solve this problem. And that's because fundamentally there is no record of private sector competition uh, in this. If you look at the, the cable networks and the telephone networks we have right now, they were built under monopoly protection. And trying to compete with an established monopoly is incredibly difficult. Um, I think it may help to, to get some um, Examples of, you know, for instance, quotes from uh, Mayor Durrell in Lafayette, Louisiana, who is conservative and has run many small businesses and is a champion of their network. Uh, he's someone that we frequently talk about, um, in part because he's so damn charismatic and in part because, you know, he's uh, has a different background than many mayors. Um, but I think one of the things that we want to see out of Next Century Cities, this organization that, that some of us have helped to launch, um, is more ability to speak across partisan lines. And um, so I think, um, you know, the, the challenge there is to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with conservative-type leaders in the community uh, where you can not have the spotlight on them, I would say, because they're going to want to think about these sorts of things for a while before they may support something. As a, as a Republican, um, the idea of supporting more government involvement than anything is probably something they're going to want to think about before they take a strong position on it. Yeah, I've been thinking of how to present it to them so it's not immediately apparent that it's a, a government-sponsored thing, so to speak. Um, and I've kind of been struggling with that. I, I don't think taking the tact of uh, explaining how the private sector won't solve the problem, I'm kind of skeptical of that, you know, because everybody's so wedded to their free market ideology. Um, yeah, and Time Warner's a big supporter of the Buffalo Chamber of Commerce. But uh, right. thanks for your, your response. This is this is something that we see in many cases, and I think you know in a minute or two we're gonna have to go on to just a different question because we have so many that have popped up. Um, but it's it's a really good question, and I think the the issue of explaining it in terms of the market not solving it is to say, look, even in places that are getting the kind of competition that we need, local governments have had to do something, and you know maybe Republicans aren't going to support the city offering services in the way that Chattanooga has. And in fact, in a place like Buffalo, without the public electricity um, history, then you may, um, they may not even be the best course for you anyway. 
Um, but they may be willing to say, okay, local government has to do something to try and make sure we don't have a monopoly. And that may be, you know, starting small with Dig One's policies or, you know, trying to find a partner and figuring out what it would take to get them to invest and that sort of thing. But the way I would phrase it is to say, local government has to do something to change the status quo. And we're going to argue about what that should be, but there shouldn't be a debate that we have to do something. And that may be a way to get the conversation started. Um, do we have a, I want to be sensitive to people. We've had a number of, we have a, such a range of people. Um, is there another question that, that you saw popping up, Lisa, that you wanted, thought we should address? Oh, I think we should maybe pop back and forth between rural and urban. Um, and so I saw one question that said, is it realistic for a small town of 500 to pursue municipal broadband? I saw that question too, and um, it made me think of, um, you know, what our recent report um, in when we talked about um, Sibley County, and we talked about Wyndham and some of the challenges that they that they face. Now they're not that small of a community, um, but um, we talked in our report. We talked about how you know they are a very small community, and um, maybe one of the things that they want, want to consider is banding together with some other communities nearby. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that's the first thing that you want to try and do. Even, I mean, if you're Buffalo, that's one thing. But if you're a town of even 25,000, um, so everything up to 25,000, I think one of the first things you want to do is try to find others to work together. Um, and that's because this is an economy of scale industry and the more people you can get, the more uh, businesses, the more residents you can get, the better you're going to be, the lower their cost will be of serving everyone. Um, I would say that in general, and I, I suspect that most of the people who are here are probably interested in internet, but there's the reality that most of the networks that have been built citywide are triple play, fiber, um, which is uh, using television, uh, internet, and telephone services. And uh, the reason for that has been the economics of it, and we're moving into a period where it's more likely that we're going to see people trying to just build internet networks. Um, I want to say Seboing in Michigan. Uh, Lisa, how many people are in Seboing? Um, there's actually around 1,800 people in Seboing, um, and their their network is primarily aerial. Um, and you know they are much like many of the other communities that we study, and that um, they approach the providers who just couldn't justify going out and making an investment. So they went ahead and did that themselves, and they they've just started signing up people. They provide a gig, um, and you know they're a really interesting community. In fact, I'm hoping to talk to them again soon to find out more about what they're doing. But their um, services are also very reasonable. And um, yeah, yeah, they they are a small community. Um, uh, Loveritt is another small community. I know there is a question. Someone was hoping to. Um, uh, I think it was Luke had asked about a question. Uh, hoping to talk to a, a rural town out west, about 5,000 people, and um, I think Powell, Wyoming. But I don't know if they have fiber. Do you know anything about Powell? Yeah, Powell does have fiber. I think they might be just a little bit bigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like 5,800 or something like that. E6500 it looks like according to Google. Yeah, I have this. I assume everyone's being able to see the screen. I just popped up a browser window to be able to surf around a little bit. Um, um, and so, you know, in the map we try to identify some other communities um, that would be useful. And um, I think PAL is a good one for out west. I think. Um, you know, to some extent in Montana, you're going to want to talk to people in Missoula, and uh, well, Butte has a private partnership, and um, and then in um, um, I'm trying to remember the other name of the city. There's another city that's looking for it, and that I believe is Bozeman. They're um, looking at some things also, and so you know, just because you're in Montana, even if the scale is a different size, you're going to want to be talking to some of the same people um, to get a sense of what. Uh, they've already looked at and that sort of thing. Um, so, and I would say that um, sm the smaller towns, it's definitely feasible, although there you really are going to really focus on internet only. 
And in many cases, in smaller towns, you may have a co-op that's nearby, uh, either a rural electric or a rural telephone co-op. Um, the rural telephones have done a great job of building fiber to the home in a number of places, and in Minnesota, we've seen a number of them expand to areas nearby. Uh, the report that Lisa and I wrote, All Hands on Deck, covers 12 different examples of local governments taking action in Minnesota, uh, and uh, a number of those were partnerships with co-ops. So we tried to lay out some of the different approaches that have been taken there. And anytime you can partner with an entity that you can trust, you're going to be um, pretty well off. Um, um, so uh, let's see here, another question. Um, how can infrastructure costs, consumer business prices, system maintenance costs, and system capabilities be estimated? Well, I think this is a good question, and I think the answer to it is not as straightforward as you might like. Uh, I got a laugh, uh, which was not intended in Seattle, when I was asked, you know, how much might it cost for Seattle to build a network? And I said, well, you know, given the number of people in Seattle, it could be on the order of $400 million, $600 million, or $200 million, <laughs> which is to say that, you know, it's sort of the order of magnitude is the most important, which is that for the city of Seattle to build a network that's going to connect most people, it's going to be in the um, hundreds of millions. Uh, oftentimes we'll take the, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of, make sure I get this right exactly. Um, it's oftentimes we take about the population uh, and multiply that by a thousand, which is a very rough order of magnitude estimate if you're looking at fiber to the home using some of the older assumptions. And I think it's important to note that if we're looking at a city of, let's say, $50,000. If they're going to consider a $50 million investment, they're probably also going to consider a $65 million investment or a $35 million investment. And so you want to, I think, have a sense of the scale. And the scale is on the order of about $1,000 per person if you want to try and build a network where you're going to connect everybody uh, over a short period of time. That varies pretty significantly based on density, based on, um, you know, whether you're going to be going aerial or or underground and that sort of thing. Um, so um, I think there's um, a number of difficult questions, but you really want to make sure that if you're making a political case for this, that you're first talking about what you're going to have. You know, you don't want the first conversation with an elected official to be, I want you to spend $35 million. <laughs> you want to talk about how this is going to change the community. It's going to result in all kinds of benefits. Uh, it's going to raise people's property values if you don't have very much right now. You're going to have um, all kinds of um, ideally more opportunities for economic development. At the same time, you want to make sure that you're not overselling the vision because just building a fiber network doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have all of those things. But you want to make sure that people have a sense of what the possibilities are and that you also have a reasonable plan of getting there. Um, but in general, if you're looking for a rough um, order of magnitude, I would say you can do worse than $1,000 per person. A lot of times that's an overestimate, but I think it's better to overestimate than underestimate. And I'll often follow it up by saying that this is about the price of a sports stadium. And it's remarkable how true that is when you compare it to the investments that larger cities make. It's not unlike that of a sports stadium, although the economic return of a fiber network is far greater than a sports stadium. Um, now I see that we have a number of people raising questions. I do want to make sure that my voice is not the only one being heard. So if you want to comment and contribute something, then I hope that you'll feel free to um, put your hand up and then we'll be able to unmute you. I believe that someone here from our team is watching for hands because I think a number of you, I recognize your names, you have things to contribute. There's no effective competition in Beverly Hills. This is this is one of the things that we find is true just about everywhere. Um, one of the things that I think is true of California communities that is not true of everyone else is that you have uh, at least one great local provider, Sonic.net, which is working in Brentwood already, um, and. I don't know how, how, how rapidly they're going to expand, but if you are a local government looking for a partner, uh, they're a terrific partner. Um, if you're a local government trying to find a partner or if you're trying to get a sense of who might partner with your local government, um, you know, I think it helps to look at these sort of ISPs that have had, have a very good record of customer service. Um, 
Now I saw there was a question here of whether they had done something in Vermont. I'm not exactly sure what that was. Uh, I was just saying in regards to a rural community question, uh, I believe there's a bunch of communities in Vermont that have uh, collaborated together. Right. So Vermont has a very interesting approach, which is almost self-financed, the EC Fiber Network for East Central Vermont Fiber Network. And they have mostly self-financed in the sense of they've sold um, – uh, paper, I want to say 15-year um, debt to individuals who are then um, uh, basically financing the network. This is sometimes people that are just looking for a good return on investment and um, other times it is to the homeowners themselves and they've been able to go from um, you know having no connections to building up a fiber network and I believe they're present in maybe like 17 or 18 towns in Vermont now and uh, they don't have a robust presence in all of them but in some of the towns they have uh, fiber options to a lot of the people and one of the things that, that their model works well is if you're living in a neighborhood um, in R Vermont rural area um, so let's say a neighborhood where you have several homes nearby and you're all interested that works a lot better for expanding those in, those networks to them than if you're just working alone. So again, we see that you really want to do your best to try and talk with your neighbors and aggregate interest. Um, you know, in one case earlier, we were talking about doing that for political power, but here it's often to lower the cost of connecting your communities. Um, I have a question from uh, Clayton who asks, um, how can we compete against Verizon in Silicon Harlem? And I think that this is a, a good question for, um, because whether you're a private company or a, or a local government, you're dealing as a small scale provider against a very big opponent. And it's important to recognize that this is going to be a challenge, but that it is definitely doable to win. Things to remember are that you're local, you probably have better customer service, if you don't have better customer service than Verizon, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, you definitely want to have really good customer service. Um, but fundamentally, you want to make sure that you're able to be more nimble. So one of the things that we talk about with communities is, you know, if you're there in the community, what are you doing that's different from Verizon or Comcast? And, you know, you're offering a higher quality service. Um, faster internet speeds, maybe symmetrical speeds, hopefully symmetrical speeds, lower cost. But, you know, what are you actually doing? And in the case of Lafayette, Louisiana, they, they peered with the local university. And so what that means is that if you're on the network in Lafayette, you're um, connecting to your local uh, university at speeds that are un, um, uh, un that, that are not slowed down in any way. They're direct connections, which is awesome because it keeps the cost for the network low. But more importantly, it keeps the prices, um, it keeps the, the quality much higher for you going to your office. Um, so if you have two offices in the Lafayette, they can both go connect to each other at much higher speeds. Um, and I'm, I'm butchering this a little bit, and it's awkward sort of standing here in my office talking to a chat window. Um, but the, the question is fundamentally, you know, are you doing things that Verizon won't do? If a business wants to do something special, if they want to have a special kind of connection, you know, can you deliver that? And do they know that you can deliver that? Um, those are the sorts of things I think you need to figure out. Um, one of the things that, that we see happening in this space is more of these sorts of customized um, connections. Someone is, I think, ready to jump in and help me out here. <laughs> um, that was one of the things that we heard um, about um, from Vince, uh, Vince, who used to work in, at, in Longmont. Um, Vince Jordan. Right, Vince Jordan. Um, and that one of the things that um, they really prided themselves on that really helped them out is they had great customer service and they would walk into a, a business and they would say we can do pretty much anything you want us to do and they made it one of their specialties is to take their service and to get creative with, with whatever they were doing and offer the business um, did you need something like security or you know do you need some special sort of of connectivity, do you need it to um, to peak here or peak there? And they that was one of the things that he said put them above and beyond is they would do whatever 
their businesses wanted. They would listen to their customers. And he said that was the thing that put them ahead of everybody else. Right, and I would go one step farther, which is to say um, that um, you um, need to, I think, go in and show them what's possible. I think you want to have a great demo of what you can do because a lot of local businesses um, or residents even may not know all the great things they can do. And so, you know, one of the things that we've seen some local governments do uh, is to provide more options for over-the-top video and saying, you know, did you know that you could do all this great stuff? Um, Cola, you have uh, your hand up. You um, want to jump in? Oh, I thought I put my hand down. Sorry. <laughs> No worries. Um, so I think you know there's a there's sort of a mixture, which is that sometimes people want to learn, and so you know you think to some extent that there's um, there's cooking classes and that sort of thing. You know you might want to try and put on some um, some ability to um, you know have a, an event where you say like these are cutting edge things in technology, and we can deliver them to you, and we can make sure that they work for you in ways that Verizon won't uh, do. I think also um, one of the things that um, these local communities really pride, um, local networks really pride, is the ability to do things that um, Verizon and Comcast don't think about. Um, things like um, offering uh, free time to uh, video chat with service people overseas. Um, things that benefit the community. Um, I think that um, local businesses and, um, and people in the community really treasure that, and I think that that gives them um, an edge when it comes to competing with um, the big competitors. Absolutely. I want to make sure I said somebody asked what the California ISP was, and it's sonic.net. Um, there's a, um, a question in terms of a return on investment number relative to the $1,000 per person number that I threw out there as a rough ballpark. And that's a, it's a very good question. I think um, the first thing to recognize is that you need to have a vision for why you're building the network. Uh, Will Acock from Wilson uh, once just sort of threw out there as a throwaway comment that, you know, as a local government, if you're looking to build a network uh, just to increase the amount of revenue coming in, you're in the wrong business. Go build a landfill. It's going to be a heck of a lot easier. And while I don't think we should see necessarily people running out and building landfills, the the, the overall lesson of, you know, this is not something to raise money is important. Return on investment should be measured in terms of um, benefits to the community. Uh, network is, sh the network should be expected to break even if that's the expectation. There's some communities like um, uh, Princeton and, uh, I'm sorry, Leverett is a better example in Massachusetts that uh, have decided to raise taxes modestly to help pay for the network. And so for them, they want the network to mostly break even. But um, for them, it's not throwing off a ton of cash is not a goal. Um, you know, the goals will be to improve economic development. And one way to measure that is if any new firms come in. But another way is to really pay close attention and work with local businesses to know if they're more competitive, if they're finding that they're better able to compete in their market because of the fiber network. So being able to measure that. Um, I think whether or not you've improved educational opportunities, if there's better health care available because of the network, something that's more common in rural areas than urban in many cases, um, those sorts of things, these are all ways to measure return on investment. But honestly, if we could measure return on investment on a dollar for dollar level better, and there was a really good return on investment in terms of just monetary return on investment, then we would see more investment from the private sector. One of the reasons we see so little investment from the private sector compared to the, the need is that the return is almost entirely indirect. It's it's community benefits. It may be higher property values. It's uh, higher quality of life, more economic development. These are all things that, you know, none of those things puts money into Comcast's pocket. And so that's one of the reasons we have this uh, financial, we have this um, market breakdown, I would say is because the return on investment is mostly indirect benefits to the community. And that's something that should fit with community investment. Uh, Clayton, you've got your hand up. Why don't you go ahead and um, say what you have to say? All right, I think we, I'm not sure if there's a, a technical issue there. 
Um, Clayton does have a question that he put in the chat, um, which is whether there's any models for leasing fiber from incumbents. And it's typically very difficult. Uh, cable companies almost never lease fiber. Uh, some of them used to, but increasingly they don't. Um, and you know, leasing fiber from the big telcos is also often cost prohibitive. So one of the things that I think you might think about as a local government or as a provider that's you know, trying to get some support from local government is the encouraging of having more dark fiber that's available. I don't think this is necessarily the, the best approach for getting internet access out to everyone, but one of the goals that I think any city should set for itself if it's not willing to do anything more substantial would be to say, in X number of years, and I would say five, seven, ten years, our goal is that no property in our community is more than, you know, uh, 100 yards or 500 yards away from a fiber connection, so that you know a small entrepreneur, uh, a um, you know a business that might specialize in this, uh, would be able to connect um, either homeowners or businesses or apartments, um, but they could do that by having to do a short fiber connection you know, having to go a few city blocks rather than a few city miles to build a network. Um, we've done a couple of podcasts with um, um, I'm Hunter Newby about some of this, I think, which is, um, I think, helpful, uh, which is looking at fiber as real estate. And I think some of the people that I talk to look at this and they say, well, you know, this is this is great and everything for like sort of an intellectual exercise of slowly expanding fiber. It doesn't result in everyone getting connections. And I think that's true. If you want to make sure that everyone is getting a connection, then, um, you know, doing this sort of approach is probably not the way to do it. But this is an approach that local governments can do if they're afraid to uh, or uninterested in getting involved in doing direct competition. Um, getting fiber throughout the community that others can then use. Um, you know, for instance, I might want to set up a neighborhood co-op. And right now, it's almost impossible for me to do that. But if there was fiber just down the street from me, that would be more possible, although there's still some economic challenges uh, because of the high cost of the gear and things like that. Um, in general, for a network, you want to have 500, 1,000 subscribers minimum. I mean, there's ways of making it work if you don't have that many, but often you do want to have that many. Uh, in order to make it work and to, you know, um, have it be most sustainable. Um, so there's a question about the utility lines and um, and the Internet of Things. Uh, the um, the Internet um, sort of getting tied up with electricity is generally good if you are an electrical uh, utility. If you uh, want to build a fiber network out to everyone and you're a municipal uh, electric company, then you have more use cases. You have the ability to use the fiber, um, you know, to benefit those uh, electrical customers. But in general, there's not a ton of money there. Uh, you know, you can think of right now a lot of these uh, networks are um, that are being used for remote meter reading and things like that. They are... Um, being, um, they're, they're often using wireless connections and not in every case but in a number um, there is the example of um, either water or electric electrical they're sending a signal once every 15 minutes or even just once a day and it's a very small you know amount of data so you're not going to necessarily make a business case with a with a, an electric utility but what you can do is to make sure that you build a network so that it takes care of all kinds of utility benefits and um, so you know one of the things we saw in Ammon Idaho is that the um, have, they don't have an electric utility but they recognize the need for more fiber throughout the community and so they connected all of their water uh, utility stations and they were able to do that um, by partnering um, with uh, not partnering so much as by combining with other projects that they're already doing and so they got fiber in the ground they had a modest revenue stream in terms of not having to pay so much for uh, the, the least connections that had been connecting it and um, that's been a tremendous benefit for them um, so the um, you know, the question of electric utility, in the case of Chattanooga, they've been incredibly ambitious, and they've set a goal of 
of using their electrical grid to prevent outages uh, by having so much more information. So when there's a failure anywhere in the network, they are able to uh, route around it very quickly, saves them on the order of, well, we just had a story not too long ago about it. Um, and let's see. Um, um, actually, um, Chris, can I, uh, can I go interrupt ahead. here? Um, yeah, I just uh, read a story recently, and I believe we're going to be publishing a story about it soon, too, that um, uh, the EPP in Chattanooga is going to be working with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Yeah, I'm actually, apparently I'm giving people a preview of it. I thought I'd posted this already. Um, I don't think so, but they're going to be working with um, the laboratory to try to even increase um, even further the amount of, of um checks to the smart grid to into to like 15 minute increments so that they can increase the efficiency even further. And they're going to use that data to share with other um, other uh, electric utilities to try to in increase efficiencies in other places as well. Right, and the number I was looking for is in that article, which is that they estimate that they've saved uh, 50 million dollars over two years for local businesses by reducing power outages by 60 percent. Um, now this is, I think, incredible for um, local businesses. Um, but if you have, you know, Excel Energy or Entergy or another private utility, they just may not be as interested in trying to create those kinds of benefits. Um, so I think with a, with the um, smart grid type stuff, it's going to vary whether you have a very big electrical utility provider that's that will probably not be interested in working with you, or if you want to uh, work with a local co-op or municipal provider that may be more willing to work with a, a fiber network. Um, Cola, you had another question? I see your hand go up and go down every now and then because I talk for oh, too sorry. long. Yeah, I had to jump out quick. It was just mainly about not having uh, a public electric utility and uh, the best way to do that without a public electric utility. Well, I think our case study on Santa Monica is the best example. Um, um, it's unfortunately one that is a um, it's not an immediate um, way to go about it. It's, um, it's incredibly difficult to do. Um, to go citywide without having the existing back end, we call it OSS or BSS um, systems that allow you to do all the, the billing and track complaints and, and do all the customer support type stuff. A lot of times local governments don't have that in the same way that you would need it. Uh, and in part, it's because if you run a water utility, you just have a different relationship with your customers than you do if you run an electric utility. And the electric utility isn't a perfect um, analogy by any way for the um, uh, municipal fiber network, uh, but it does get closer than others do. So uh, the way that Santa Monica did it was by starting and reaching out to uh, community anchor institutions, um, you know, the schools, uh, the community colleges, the municipal facilities, uh, oftentimes, you know, municipal departments may not talk very well across um, their silos. And in Santa Monica, they did a really good job of consolidating needs, figuring out what people uh, needed, what these different uh, entities all had in common, and starting to develop um, uh, so, so, uh, solutions for them, which, you know, in some cases was a fiber network, in other cases it may have been an application. But the key was that they started by scratching their own itch. They built a fiber network that connected their own institutions first. They built it in such a way that they could expand it. They started connecting local businesses uh, after they were expanding the fiber network further to do all the traffic synchronization and things like that. And that's something that anyone who's in a city of, you know, I'd say more than 50,000 people, uh, I don't know exactly where the where the breakdown is, but the ability to try and get grants from Department of Transportation to expand fiber networks to connect um, traffic synchronization and things like that is something we've seen a lot of cities use. Um, so you think but fun the, ID, the IT department is the best way to go, as Santa Monica did? It's a good question. I think I think you want to go through the department that has the most visionary and competent leadership, <laughs> which is not always the IT department. Um, I think you know the goal is you need to have someone who's out on point on this that sees the promise and is really going to work with it and is good at communicating. You want to avoid turf wars. You don't want you know the director of public works to feel like they're being left out or being screwed in some way. Um, 
So, okay, so it doesn't have to be the IT department, but just finding someone within the government who is receptive and, as you put it, visionary. I think so. I mean, I think it certainly could be, you know, um, it could end up being something that is actually run independent of the IT department, depending on how the IT department is structured. Um, but I think that the first goal has to be the right champion. This is something that, that Jim Baller, who's been around working on these networks for far longer than I have, he's always identified as one of the keys, having a champion, someone, you know, not necessarily just one person, but at least one person who is uh, incredibly supportive and is willing to put in a ton of time on it, and someone who people are willing to listen to, right? Not someone who's like snarky and annoying <laughs> and know-it-all, um, but someone who's able to communicate well. Sometimes you can find someone like um, in an economic development authority who can approach people that way, the right way, not the snarky way. Right, and I and I would say that I mean I think that's a perfectly good approach. It's often in an IT department because people who are in IT are less intimidated by technology. Um, in many cases, the economic development people I think don't want to risk saying things that are technically infeasible or being made fun of if they say megabytes rather than megabits, which is something that everyone does sooner or later. <laughs> um, but it, it helps to, um, I think, have a good communications um, ability because ultimately if you're if, if you have an, a champion inside the city they need to make sure that other powerful people within city the city aren't going to shut it down you don't want the director of public works who has you know a very good connection with the city manager to say I'm going to find ways of undermining this uh, you want someone who's going to be able to rally the team around it um, so we have a, uh, socially savvy who can navigate government. sorry go ahead you no, no, and that's absolutely true. I think you want to have someone who is savvy, and that's someone who you want to have more of the face. And, you know, one of the other things is that you want to have an inside-outside game. Without without someone on the inside that's excited about it, it's almost impossible to get something like this off the ground, I think. You know, even if you get a great coalition of local business leaders together and others, um, if you have people within the city that are going to undermine it and you don't have a real champion, it's not going to happen. Similarly, if you have elected yeah, officials, go ahead. We've got a um, council member who's really on board and a legislator. So that's a terrific start. And but ultimately, I think if you want them to be really effective as a council member or as a city staff person, uh, or in both, you want to make sure that you're putting pressure on them from outside. And you want it to be respectful pressure, right? I mean, you want to have, um, you don't want to have people saying, you know, this mayor sucks because he hasn't yet delivered on municipal broadband or something along those lines, which we see from time to time. And believe me, I've said things like that from time to time. <laughs> um, but there's, um, you know, you have to have a, a recognition that if, if there's no outcry, if they're not seeing op-eds and editorials in the paper, if they're not hearing about it in election time, you know, you can't expect local leaders to just go ahead and push an expensive initiative without, um, without them being a strong encouragement from outside the city. So you want to have someone that's charismatic, that's the head of a citizens group or something like that, that's putting some pressure on outside, generally, respectfully, you know, trying to say, this is a good idea, we need to move in this direction, and celebrating uh, city staff and elected officials that are moving in that direction. Um, and, you know, there, there may be times when you want to point out that someone's being counterproductive, but we see in some cases in um, Seattle right now, for instance, people want to talk about how the mayor has taken money from the uh, cable and telephone companies. And it's true, although in my experience, I don't think that the cable and telephone companies have bought the mayor of Seattle. I think they've tried to, and I think they've failed. And, you know, the mayor hasn't been mayor for that long, and... Um, so I think you just want to, in general, focus on positives and that sort of thing when you're mounting these kinds of campaigns. Um, here's Can a, I just add one thing, too? No. <laughs> yeah, <go ahead. laughs> just that you remember the long term because um, as you're um, getting your uh, people together because, you know, this is uh, the political forum and people come and go. And so, um, and it takes a while to get... Um, to go from your vision to your reality when you're talking about creating this type of, of 
of network. So, um, so as people move from you know office to beyond office, you just need to kind of constantly be looking a, a little ahead as well. Um, we have a, a question: um, the difference in ideology of closed versus open access networks, and. I think that's a very good question that I think we can spend some time on here, but we may actually end up doing a, uh, a discussion that would focus entirely on that. Um, I think, in my mind, the, the goal is that ultimately we're all living in a future in which we have many choices, um, certainly more than we do today. And I think that even a, a network that's built closed, which is to say that, let's just assume that the city builds a network and the city is the only operator using the network, that would be a closed network, um, that in the future, if there's a viable opportunity to open the network, that that's something that we would hope local governments would be doing, I think. Um, I think that right now a lot of communities are building closed networks that would prefer to build open networks, but they're doing that because the revenue potential of, of open networks is somewhat lower, and they're afraid they won't be able to pay the debt of building the network if they leave it open. And the reason for that, I often say, is because if you are trying to make a network cash flow um, and and you're taking all of the revenues from the network and it's still a hard business case, imagine how much harder it would be if you are then uh, sharing those revenues with another party. Um, I think that's sort of the simplest way of, of explaining it. So I feel like right now there's ideological issues of open versus closed, but for the most part the decisions as to whether a network is open or closed is made at a practical or um, um, at a practical level, which is to say, what will generate the most revenue. Um, I also think, and this is me getting a little bit out on a branch that, excuse me, could very well break underneath me, which is to say that I think we would see more open networks if they were financed more like our roads. Our roads are not expected to pay for themselves entirely. Our roads are paid for largely by user fees, but not entirely. Um, we subsidize them to some extent with tax dollars. So if you have communities that are willing to say, I'm going to build an open network and I'm going to connect to everyone, and most of the network will be paid for with revenues from the network, but not all of it, then I think that's a model that will result in um, more open access networks. And frankly, I think get us more to the sort of situation we want to be in, where there's more opportunities for uh, ISPs to compete and you don't have to invest you know, millions or hundreds of millions of dollars into a fiber network just to be able to get some customers. Um, so that's how I might address that. And Jeff, if you want to um, follow up at all, um, you can feel free. Uh, but I think that's sort of a, a good short answer. Um, there's a question here about um, talking points for um, ROI and service improvements for hospitality. We're a tourist town in St. Beach, St. Pete Beach, Florida. Well, Florida's got some interesting approaches, um, not just for the the tourist towns, but some of the places where um, where we see, uh, you know, areas like um, Martin County, where they built a great network, and we have a a case study about that. Um, that's a network that. Um, is serving just municipal functions right now and also some hospital and things like that. Um, but they also uh, have, here it is, Florida County, uh, Florida Fiber, Martin County saves big with a gigabit network. Um, but they're also doing some healthcare type stuff. Um, but one of the things that you find is that if you have fiber throughout an entire community and you want to make sure there's Wi-Fi everywhere, that's great. It's a great amenity for hospitality. I know that when I travel, I would much prefer, since I'm using my, my mobile device a lot more than I would at home, um, I prefer not to just run right through my data cap. The ability to have Wi-Fi in a lot of places I'm going is going to be something I'm going to like. Um, I think that um, making sure that um, hotels have great internet connections. Now that is a challenge there because a lot of those hotels, the big chains, have nationwide collect um, nationwide contracts. And so, even if you can offer a great fiber connection at affordable prices, the hotel might be contractually obligated to take a more expensive, lower quality service from AT&T, for instance, if that's who gives them their national contract. Um, so there's an issue there. 
Um, I think one of the things I'd be looking at in terms of service improvements and hospitality is Santa Monica again. Um, they built their network. They have uh, such an influx of people to some of their attractions like the pier and the business districts uh, that they've really been trying to figure out how to have as much of the cutting edge technology to make life easier. They have uh, all their parking ramps tell you how many spaces are available and you can run an app on your phone that will tell you where parking is available in Santa Monica. Um, they have uh, you know, Wi-Fi in a lot of different places. Um, they have security cameras in a number of places and I, you know, I am of two minds of this because we don't want to encourage I think um, a society in which we're always on camera, but at the same time, um, the ability to have better security and reduce crime if you do it intelligently, uh, which Santa Monica actually has a pretty good privacy policy from what I understand in terms of accessing cameras. Um, those are all things that go hand in hand, and if you have fiber everywhere, you can have very high quality cameras installed very quickly uh, in areas where you might need it. Uh, Lisa, I was, wasn't sure it sounded like you were making... Sure, um, yeah, there's also um, some places, um, in fact, I spoke with a gentleman from Aurora, Illinois the other day, and uh, what they've done is they have quite a few theaters and venues for musical acts, and they've used fiber um, to bring both Wi-Fi and to connect to uh, share those performances with other places around the country in those ways with their network. Right, and I would say that you know, I'm um, there's a number of, of churches, for instance, that are doing podcasts or even live um, webcasts of their services, and that's something where um, people may uh, really want to be able to access. So more and more having high quality internet available everywhere is gonna, um, I think, help people. Um, so if they're on vacation, they want to follow what's going on in their church from while they're sitting on the beach, <laughs> more power to them. Um, so regarding the, the open access, um, Jeff says, and I think this is worth highlighting, I like the idea of our roadways. seems that for it to really work requires that the network operator not be in the business to make money, um, but more to provide the service and create opportunities for innovation and allowing subscribers a greater uh, variety of choices. And I think that's exactly it. Um, and actually, I think that the majority of Americans are in that position right now, but that elected officials aren't aware of it yet. Uh, I talk to conservatives and liberals alike who say, I just want something better. I'm tired of you know, paying too much uh, for Comcast or someone else, and I frankly think I could be doing a lot better, and if my taxes have to go up and my, in order for my telecom bill to go down, then I'm okay with that, and especially if there's no net change or if I end up paying less on whole, which is the case in Leverett, uh, Massachusetts, uh, so much the better. Um, so we have a, a question that just came in. Um, the biggest uh, obstacle is often incumbent opposition, which is definitely the case. Um, uh, so how does one organize against that sort of opposition? Well, Lisa, I think this is one where we can definitely double team it. Um, I think one of the the best things to do is to um, identify a strategy for being able to respond to it quickly. So uh, in Lafayette, for instance, because the mayor was their champion, he was able to have a press conference whenever the other side said anything. That oftentimes was a lie, and he could respond to it. And frankly, the first lesson that we learned in Lafayette, and something that I think other communities are still learning, is that uh, opposition is actually your friend. If you want to build one of these networks and there's no opposition, you're probably not going to get any coverage in the paper, you're not going to get in the television stations, and a lot of people aren't ever going to be aware of it. Opposition is what gives you the key to be able to do it because the press loves opposition. Stay <laughs> Lisa, would you disagree? <laughs> um, one of the things I remember the most about Lafayette was how um, the um, the community was able to take all of these uh, basically insulting anti-muni ads and turn it around so that it just really pissed off the people who lived there. Right. So they actually had this. Uh, they had a push poll where right. um, the uh, Cox or SBC Southwest or South Bell. Bell South, Bell South was the company at the time, now AT&T, um, they had a poll that was going around, but it wasn't really, it was what's called a push poll in politics, which is that you're not really trying to get a sense of what 
people are thinking, you're trying to actually put thoughts in their mind. The, the classic question is, would you support candidate X if he stopped beating his spouse? Um, you know, you don't really want to ask that. You really want the person to associate spousal abuse with that candidate. That's a push-pull. So they had all kinds of questions like that to suggest that a municipal network in Lafayette would result in, um, you know, uh, um, people, white people getting better connections than, than uh, people in the African-American section of town. That the city would, would limit how the network could be used um, because the city also limits uh, the ability to water a lawn on a Wednesday and a Friday. I mean, this is literally the kind of question. We actually have the audio floating around somewhere on our site. Yeah, we um, do, on our site. And the thing is, uh, the, the people who, who were driving the, um, the uh, movement for the network uh, said, look, I mean, this, obviously these people don't know us. You know, they don't live here. They don't know us. This is what they think of us. Right, and what really helped was they recorded it, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. they had a record of it, and that was tremendous. So um, you want to do things like that. You want to be able to respond and say, in the case of Longmont, they were able to say, look, Comcast is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in Denver, which is the big town nearby, um, in order to um, you know, persuade us. They're not even spending the money in Longmont. They're spending the money on public relations out of Denver. And I think that was something that helped them to be able to say, look, these guys are not with us. Um, but I think, you know, you want to you wanna be identified. You want to make sure that city council and uh, the mayor and their office knows what kind of attacks they're going to see. If you're in Comcast and CenturyLink country, you're going to hear that, um, you know, the city should not do this because of the utopia failure. You're going to hear that Burlington Telecom is a disaster. And so, you know, if you're in, in Buffalo, you're probably going to hear about Burlington Telecom and how they screwed up. And you're only going to hear part of the story. Right, right. But you're, you're not going to hear about all the many success stories. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so, you know, you want to have a bit of a, you want to have a prep session with elected officials where you say, this is what the other side is going to say. And in fact, we released a paper um, on this um, that um, we released a month or two ago that I think does a, a really good job. I mean, this was our goal anyway. We released this paper that looks at an industry report. This is a report that um, was released by uh, Stephen Titch, who opposes municipal networks. And so we went through and we rebutted it line by line. So, you know, we have these lines here. Um, the, the, the beauty about this report is it, he uses all of the same arguments that everybody else uses because there's only a limited number of arguments that they use anyway. So, um, so you're free to use these arguments. And, and whatever you say, wherever you live, many of these arguments you'll see again, and you'll be able to use very similar replies. <laughs> Exactly, and this is something that we designed hoping that, you know, if you're in Buffalo, for instance, you may want to hand this out to your champion and say, circulate this around because here's what you're going to hear and here's how we respond. Uh, for those of you who aren't able to see the, the video, this is a report called uh, Correcting Community Fiber Fallacies, the Reality of Lafayette's Gigabit Network, and it's responding to a paper called Lessons in Municipal Broadband from Lafayette, Louisiana. And we just basically took a bunch of their claims and we annotated their report to be more clear about um, what the reality was. You know, and there's some things that we actually agreed with them on. Um, and that's the, and some of those things are, you know, the kinds of questions that elected officials should be able to ask before they commit to a project. We're kind of, are there any other questions people have? I mean, I'm actually... Um, um, surprised we have a number of people who are still here. Um, I think, you know, to some extent, maybe people are trying to formulate questions. Um, but um, there's a question about the underground conduits um, that uh, New York City is looking at. Um, and, and I feel like, um, you know, if you're any city right now that's not engaging in some form of dig once policy is in trouble. Um, every community should be figuring out ways to get fiber and or conduit in the ground as part of other conduit, as part of other capital projects. So if there's a water project that's moving along through town or if a street is being totally rebuilt uh, or there's, you know, utility work being done, you should be at least evaluating whether or not it makes sense to get conduit and fiber in the ground at that time. 
And that's conduit of fiber that you might use as a city. It's conduit of fiber that you might lease out to a private sector provider. And frankly, it's conduit of fiber in some cases that may never be used. But if you even use 25 or 30 percent of that conduit and fiber you put in at incredibly low cost, you're going to be so far ahead because the, the pennies you spend on putting in conduit you don't ever use is going to be outweighed by the dollars you save for every bit of that conduit that you do use. So, you know, on any sort of question in, in local governments, they need to be, as a matter of course, actively considering whether or not with every capital project that's disturbing the ground, does it make sense to put conduit and or fiber in the ground as part of this? And to some extent, that's, um, you know, the sort of thing that in, in some cases city managers are saying, we don't want to do this. We, we don't think this is our responsibility. We think that the private sector um, should take care of it. And <laughs> whether you think the private sector should or should not take care of it, the reality is if you don't do anything in five or ten years, you're probably going to be in a lot of trouble. So um, that's something that I think is, is really important to be considering. Chris, what would you say about um, whether or not a community should assess what assets they have now? I mean, there are communities that have started talking about developing municipal networks, and they don't even really know what they have under the ground now. Right. I think they should be looking at that. I mean, in some cases, you may find that, particularly in larger cities, you have fiber or conduit that you weren't even aware of because some department put it in and it made sense for them, but they didn't realize it would be useful to other departments. Those sorts of assessments are smart and should be done. I think that every local government should be looking at what it's paying. And in fact, this is a recommendation I give to people who ask me, what should I do to encourage a low, the first couple of steps in municipal networks? And one of the things I often say is you should be figuring out where your city is currently paying money on telecommunications. Are you leasing lines from the cable or the telephone company or from an independent party? Sometimes there's local governments or local uh, private companies that are also doing this. And frankly, you know, we want to encourage local businesses to the best we can, um, although we want to make sure that we're ultimately meeting the needs of the community. Um, but are you spending millions of dollars each year on telephone and internet connections that you could provide to yourself if you built the facilities at a lower cost? And we see this in many cases. And, and Lisa, I can't even imagine the number of stories you've written at this point that started off with, why did the community build the network? Well, they looked at what they were getting from the private sector for leasing, and they realized that they could have 10 times or 100 times the capacity at a fraction of the cost and have the certainty that over the course of coming years, their prices were not going to raise very much. Um, because Right, right. And also another place where they try to save money is in schools. Right. I'm and, just taking a little drink. Oh, okay. And <laughs> and that is that is another source of savings, and that's another place where um, that often um, prompts communities to look at what they're doing and what they could do differently to save money. Right. One of the things I just wanted to throw out um, on this for people who are trying to learn more about this sort of stuff is um, we try to tag everything. And um, right now we have so many stories it's actually turned into a bit of a mess. But, you know, if you are the city of Buffalo and you're thinking about this, you might want to look at stories in Baltimore. You might want to look at other, you know, large industrial cities that um, have been considering things and even, you know, ask me to connect you with people there so you can share strategies. Every time we write about a city like Baltimore, we'll also tag the story Maryland or, you know, California. So if you want to know everything that's going on in a state, we try to have a tagging system that will work for that. Um, and then we have a number of resources from frequently asked questions that are, um, you know, it's uh, um, questions often about fiber and wireless and stuff like that. We have these fact sheets. Um, we try to have a glossary, so if you're looking at our stories and you see something's um, underlined um, in a, I believe it's a dotted underline. Um, of course, you can never find an example when you're looking for one. Um, and you hover over it, it should give you a definition for any technical terms. Um, and then we have a number of videos that um, we think are helpful. Um, so those are some things on our site that I think not everyone is aware of. We have a weekly um, repos or weekly newsletter for the stories that we put up on muninetworks.org if you'd like to get them in your emails. Um, 
So um, I think if there's not any other questions, we can probably start shutting this down. Um, and if, if we didn't get to your question, just re-ask it, because I think we got to most of them. And ultimately, I think, you know, on many of these issues, the answer is, you know, if you're looking for someone to lead you, it's, you know, to some extent you need to, um, you need to take a little bit of a of a jump off and recognize that you know, seven and a half years ago I didn't know anything about this. Even three years ago, Lisa, you were just starting to to get into or just about to get started in this, and it's amazing what you can learn because it's not as as technical as you might think. And um, if you put in a little bit of effort, a lot of the people that are working in this policy, um, I've watched them as they started, and um, you can do a lot if you really get engaged in it. You really can, and there is still a lot to be learned. And um, probably the people who are listening now, um, if you're looking for somebody to lead you, probably you are going to be the ones who are doing the leading. Yes, and here's the, the quote from, um, that, uh, quoting Gandhi from Kola, um, be the change you wish to see in the world. And um, I think that's exactly ultimately, I mean, you know, a lot of us are um, either trying to figure out how to push other people to do it and to support them or to do it ourselves. And um, um, I, I hope that you'll be in touch and you can certainly always ask us questions. We do our best to answer them. Um, in some cases, we may just defer until we can get into another forum like this. Um, but please stay in contact with us and we're happy to do our best uh, to try and help you out. And to some extent, if you have a community that is interested or you know of a, of a group of communities, I do travel around to you know spend a day. Um, typically, we ask for a travel costs and a modest honorarium. Um, but if you want someone like me to come in and to you know spend a day talking with your elected officials or talking with people about um, the lessons that we've learned and how communities have done this, then uh, I'm happy to try and work that out. And generally, I'll try to tag it on to another event when I'm nearby. So feel free to reach out if you're interested in that sort of a thing. So um, thank you everyone for checking this um, out. And um, it sounds Thanks like Thanks for some... your great questions. I'll thank you all for coming and asking great questions and wish you luck because this is a, something that needs to be done in our communities. Thank you.